Okay. So as you can see, I've got cross-eyed uh, Leslie behind me. Excuse me, wait a minute. There we go. I've got Leslie behind me, and I've been Leslie Jones, my portrait of her, but I've been trying to reposition, re reconstruct her. Um, it's so embarrassing right now, and she's because she's cross-eyed. But I've been trying to reconstruct her. I pulled her out of my storage unit the other day, as I said in my last video, and I really need her to be better. I'm capable of better. When I was painting this, I was um, in Virginia, and I just didn't get it right for various reasons. Somewhere in my head, I didn't get them right, get it right. So I pulled her out, and I'm redoing her, and that's what I'm going to do today. And I, I'm fairly embarrassed about the, uh, the her hands, her face, her eyes, her crossed eyes. But we all go through this as artists, as painters, you know. We always have issues, and um, I'm, you know, there's artists that I'm mentoring online, or there's like hundreds of artists who I'm kind of mentoring online, and it's just to say, it's just a painting, we can fix it, you know, and it also helps me, because when I'm completely embarrassed about a painting, you know, I, a painting isn't right, for some reason putting myself online helps me to focus and get it right to be able to reconstruct it correctly and it's not always in the first live feed that I get it right but it's somewhere down the line eventually I, I'm embarrassed enough where my head fixes it now uh, that's the first issue is something she's cross-eyed and awful number two I took a bunch of bo books out from the library so we could listen to audiobooks but I took out Eddie Izzard's autobiography really excited about it totally unlistenable. It is completely and totally unlistenable. It's like listening to a five-year-old on too much sugar, uh, even on my, more like me on one of my days where I'm flittering all over the place. Um, he's just too many commentaries, too much ad-libbing, too much shooting off um, into 50 different directions. And I can't have it, not for, not for me to keep my focus. Um, so, I'm totally, I'm so disappointed. I love Eddie Izzard, and I was so excited about listening, listening to his autobiography, but just couldn't take it. After two discs, after five minutes, I was done. But um, to, I gave it two discs, and he didn't chill out, and he didn't correct himself. He just kept flying all over the place. So... It's great on stage, not so great <clears throat> as an audiobook. I wanted to learn about them, but can't because I can't take it. Um, and then the other, the other options I took out were all Shakespearean based, and I didn't even realize it. So I've got King Lear, I've got The Merchant of Venice, and then I've got Fear of Lear or something. And I'm totally thrown. So I'm not putting any of those on. I'm going to put on the radio instead, WGBH out of Boston, and listen to them. They've been talking about the march, uh, the march in Boston yesterday, the um, anti-Nazi, anti-faux neo-Nazi shit uh, people, uh, the white white supremacists, uh, premise, white supremacists, like the whole you know white is right free speech-ish kind of thing that was supposed to happen in Boston yesterday and instead was protested right out of the commons and it made me so proud. 40, about 40,000 people, it's estimated, were there. The city pulled together or, you know, a lot of people pulled together and said, we're, we're not doing this anymore. We're not doing this anymore. And so uh, they're talking about it a lot on GBH. I don't really want to listen to the news, but it's the only thing I've got. I've got to shut off my iPad. and uh, To listen to anything else, I have to shut off my iPod and put on podcast, but I'm not going to. So, okay, that's enough of that. We're going to listen to the radio, or I'm going to. You can do whatever you want with the volume. I'm just going to be painting. And um, in yesterday's video, I talked about book binding tape. Because on top of her awful cross-eyedness, on top of all the hideous, nightmarish, just amateurish mess I've made of her face and, and her basic structure, I also poked a hole in the canvas. I poked a nice little hole in the canvas because I wasn't being really careful with her. We've had some interest in it, but now I've made 
it's just too many issues. So I'm fixing her. I'm going to fix the hole in the canvas. Not today. But I talked about the tape. I'm trying to keep myself online. I'm pulling in Eddie Izzard. Um, I talked about the tape that I use. The tape that is used, book binding tape, that's used to um, fix a hole that you pull the canvas together, you put this particular tape over the top, it's a canvas tape, it's a book binding tape on the back, then you sand the front down to almost the canvas area, cover it with gesso, sand that down, cover it with gesso, sand that down, cover it with gesso again, and then you can start painting over it, and hopefully you won't see the tear. You can just keep sanding the gesso and reapplying it, but you don't want to get too obsessive and weird about it. Anyway, this is the tape I was talking about. It comes in black or white. It's canvas with adhesive on the back, a really good adhesive, but to make sure it sticks to the canvas, what I do to make sure it sticks to the canvas is I take an, um, an iron, put it on low level heat, put the painting on the floor, put the, pull the canvas together, put the tape over the back, put the iron on top and just leave it there for a few minutes, like, I don't know, three, five minutes to make sure the adhesive actually does adhere to the canvas. And then I go turn it over, apply gesso, sand it, the whole thing. But I wanted to show people, because I've been asked, what type of tape is it? Let's see. There's the tape. It's by Lineco. There's the item number. 5501505. It's available through Dick Blick. It runs about $20. But there it is. It's a book repair or spine repair tape. It comes in black or white. It's fantastic. It has saved me so many times. But, all right, I'm going to put on WGBH. I'm not going to turn on the air conditioner. Even though it's warm, I'm going to put on the fan, and let's just get to work. Where's my thing? Oh. I'm going to uncross eyed. If all goes well, uh, Leslie will be much better off, in much better shape in, a co in an hour or two. Fingers crossed. Sunbug Solar, a solar energy installer, is proud to sponsor the 897 WGBH online stream. More at sunbugsolar.com. Um, the thing that I hear. Idea that uh, white people are under siege or that there's a race war, that they're going to be extinct. Um, where does that come from? Well, I mean, it comes from all sorts of things. I mean, it comes from people like the conspiracy mongers, uh, the info wars of this world who talk about the sort of the feminization of America and the the pressure that, that white men are under. Uh, it also comes from the sort of philosophies of, of Hitler and other known fascists uh, that are kind of never really gone away is still simmering out there but I mean ultimately this comes down to you know bog standard blame it on somebody right I mean it's scapegoating what do these white supremacists hear and see from the Trump administration that makes them feel like it's okay to come out of the shadows now well silence which we talked about earlier but I really think a key character was this guy Steve Bannon who has of course now just been removed from the White House I mean this guy was a really really key character because a lot of the white supremacists a lot of the racists in the country really saw him as their inside guy he was right there at the highest echelons of power now there are still some other characters left I mean you still have uh, Steve, Stephen Miller other people that, that, are, that the white supremacists are fans of but Bannon was really a central character so maybe you can clarify this for me. Now, I've asked Richard Spencer, the white nationalist, at least three different times, and I've never got a satisfactory answer. So as someone who's been watching these groups and seeing what they do, what's the difference between a Nazi, a Klansman, and the alt-right? It seems like they all want the exact same thing. I I don't understand why we have to parse out these words. I mean, you're, you're asking the wrong guy if you want if you want a clarification for that. I mean, frankly, I, I think there's very little difference between them. I mean, if, if you look, for example, at Charlottesville, and, and you've got people like Richard Spencer now, in the days after, coming out and saying, you know, we're not really racist, we're not really Nazis, we don't really believe that stuff. Look, everybody knew that what was going to happen on Saturday was being organized by and was going to be focused around the neo-Nazis and the very, very, very racist people in this country. If 
people like Richard Spencer and the people who support him don't want to be involved with those people, don't show up. You know, don't show up to Charlottesville on Saturday. So uh, they, they could very easily have had a different rally somewhere else. I mean, there's unquestionably a connection there. Frankly, I think the difference is, is a semantic one, and it's in terms of, of how blatant these people want to get and how willing they are to stand up for what they truly believe. <laughs> Let me tell you, my friend, as a black man in America, if I see any of them, they are radicals to me. <laughs> so moving on, let's let's talk about the counter protesters now. Um, the extreme ones are being called the Antifa movement. Who are these people? I mean, I've heard that phrase a lot. I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly who they are. Well, you and a lot of people in America, I mean, I think we need to be cautious about even talking about something that is the Antifa movement. Now, I spent the last couple of months going and interviewing as many so-called Antifa as I could, and most of them will kind of look at you when you when you talk about Antifa and say, well, I'm, I'm anti-fascism, but I don't really regard myself as an Antifa. So I don't think this is an organized movement. I think it's more a sort of a collective term that's being used to describe anyone who's really upset at the fact that these guys are out there, you know, chanting Nazi slogans and saying these hurtful things and want to fight against what they genuinely see as kind of creeping fascism in the United States. I uh, have read some reports that have said that basically a lot of uh, the alt-right or whatever you want to label them that were in Charlottesville, uh, many of them, uh, their identities have been revealed and they are losing their jobs. Uh, I wonder if that will put a chilling effect on these people coming out and being a part of these type of movements. Well, interestingly, the Antifa, uh, for, 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 for what it's worth, what they do is they, you know, they'll cover up and they wear masks and they wear bandanas for partly that reason, partly because they don't want to be identified by law enforcement. But I think what you're likely to see uh, in response to what's going going on with these kind of revelations and, and, and people losing their jobs is that these all right guys are going to start showing up in masks too. I mean, they'd be kind of stupid not to, I guess, unless their work already knows who they are and their neighbors already know who they are. I think you're going to see more bandanas on the right as well as the left. So these rallies are breaking out all over the country. Uh, what's your prediction for them? I mean, are, are we in the new normal? Will we see Charlottesville repeated all over the country? I think it would be too much to say we're going to see Charlottesville repeated across the country for two reasons. Number one, because any time these far-right groups get out in numbers, the local police, the federal police are going to be all over them. They're going to be right out there in force to try and you know do a better job, frankly, of policing it than they did in Charlottesville and in, in the previous rallies before that. And, and also, I mean... You know, frankly, our people are scared, you know, I mean, when people see all of this violence going on, yeah, I mean, some of the more hardcore people are going to keep on showing up, but I'm not sure if you're going to see the sorts of crowds still showing up. Having said that, you know, there are still going to be protests going forwards. Both of these sides are very energized and you're still going to be seeing people showing up. I just don't know if it'll be as big as Charlottesville. Will Carlos is a reporter with Reveal covering extremism and extremist groups in America. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Al. For white nationalist Richard Spencer, Charlottesville is not over. We are going to make Charlottesville the center of the universe. We are going to come back here often. Your head's going to spin. The, 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 how many times we're going to be back here? We are absolutely never backing down. Coming up, I talked to Spencer about the connection between his movement and violence. You're listening to Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. There are so many ways to get involved here at WGBH, and one way is by volunteering some of your time to lend a hand at WGBH events, like the upcoming Food and Wine Festival. Volunteering at WGBH is a great way to meet fellow listeners, support your community, and have some fun while you're at it. To find out more about becoming a WGBH volunteer and to sign up, visit WGBH.org slash volunteer. Funding for our programs comes from you and South Coast Artists' 14th Annual Open Studio Tour this weekend in Tiverton and Little Compton, Rhode Island, and Dartmouth and Westport, Massachusetts. You can download a tour brochure at southcoastartists.org.
and members of the Ralph Lowell Society, these most generous annual contributors lead the way in sustaining WGBH as a public media resource, available and free to all. WGBH.org. Yeah, looking a little crazy. From the Center for Investigative Reporting at PRX, this is Reveal. I'm Al Letson. In today's show, we're looking at what led to the violence and tragedy in Charlottesville, Virginia, where white supremacist groups clashed with counter-protesters. President Trump was criticized for not immediately speaking out against the extreme right. But when he did, some white nationalists accused him of placating the left. This is from an alt-right radio show called The Political Cesspool. There's no limit to my fury that I have for these people from the president all the way down. There's no limit to the hatred I have. I hope you people out there will see you have no government up anymore, people. You have no president. You have no senators. You have nothing. You have no representation whatsoever. Then the president seemed to walk back his comments when he criticized what he called the alt-left. This drew praise from white supremacists, including Richard Spencer. He's the one who coined the term alt-right. He made it pretty clear that what happened there will only galvanize his movement further. I've interviewed Richard Spencer twice since Donald Trump was elected. The second time back in March, we talked about a lot of things that really came to the surface in Charlottesville, including whether the words and actions of his movement for a white nation or huh. ethnostate were inciting violence. Richard told me he was getting a lot more donations for his group, the National Policy Institute, but also facing a lot more criticism, mainly because of something that had happened at the group's annual conference in Washington, D.C. It was less than two weeks after Trump was elected, and he was giving the keynote speech. And it was a, a really great speech, a bit on the bombastic side. To be white is to be a striver, a crusader, an explorer, and a conqueror. We build, we produce, we go upward. And at the end of the speech, I, I did want to end it uh, with a bang. And, you know, this is, again, it was a week after the election. And I said, hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. Obviously, that was highly provocative. And I raised a glass. I was uh, I had a glass of whiskey that was there on the podium with me. It was, you know, getting late. And uh, some of the people in the audience jumped up and gave Roman salutes. This, of course, created a massive outrage because it was recorded and a, a, a video went viral. And I think it was, you know, terribly misunderstood. Let, let me let me uh, let me let me let me pause you there. What's a Roman salute? A Roman salute is probably you would probably. It's better known known as a, a Hitler salute, just when you hold your arms straight out in the air. Right. So, so can you understand why there was a big ruckus about all this? I mean, you are. I, I, I don't know if you if you describe yourself as this, but I would describe you as a white nationalist. Do you do you agree with that? That's fine. I, the word the term white nationalist is fine. Yes. Okay. So that's so, an accurate term. So so you're a white nationalist. You say hail Trump, which you know goes back to hail Hitler. Um, well, it goes hail to the chief. Yeah, but how often I mean, do people it, say that? I mean, come on, that, that, that's that's. I was being provocative. The fact is, I have been photographed giving a straight arm communist salute with a clenched fist uh, multiple times in Vanity Fair. Actually, I'm not and disagreeing that everyone, you're being provocative. I'm just saying that, like, yeah. if you're being provocative and you are a white nationalist and you do the type of salute that the Nazis use, people are going to label you a Nazi. Uh, you know. <laughs> I, the, two things on that. I, I think first off, the the term Nazi has been over abused to this extent where it, it's it's becoming ridiculous. I, I mean, it is it is kind of the other N word. Uh, it is a way oh. of ritualistically yeah. humiliating someone by calling them a Nazi. You're basically putting someone out of the bounds of humanity. So I, th I think that like when you talk about a Nazi as a white nationalist and someone who is bad, I think that that term applies. When you're talking about someone as, especially like if a white person in America is talking about a black person and calling them the N-I-double-G-E-R term, that's a whole different ball of wax. So all your beliefs, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I think that this is the one thing that like I didn't get clear from you the last time we talked I don't okay. understand what the difference between white nationalists and what you believe is different from what Nazis believe is different from what oh, the Ku Klux Klan believe. No, I'm, 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 I'm genuinely asking you, man, to clear it up for me so, so I can understand. Because I would say that you're a Nazi, but if you don't 
feel like you are, please explain it to me. Like, I'm open to hear what you have to say. Okay, uh, let me start from a point of common ground. Okay. Whenever anyone uh, engages, any, any white person engages in, a, in an identity movement, identity politics, we are always called a handful of terms. You are literally Hitler, you're a Nazi. That, that's of terms. You are literally Hitler, you're a Nazi. That, that's the, the big one. Uh, you're the Ku Klux Klan, you're a Southern Confederate, you're, it, it, can, it goes on and on. You're segregationist, etc. Yeah. We are labeled, we are dehumanized by being labeled Nazi and so on. Now, I would say this, in terms of who I am, my raising a glass and saying hail Trump, I think people, a lot of people, look, certainly people freaked out and were offended, but I think actually at the end of the day, even my fiercest critics more or less got it. I was being highly provocative. I was celebrating this euphoric moment that we're all experiencing. Let me, let me ask you this. So you, you said that um, in that meeting, and I really want to move off of this, but, but we keep yeah. coming back to this, but you said in that meeting you were being provocative, people have been drinking, you gave this rousing speech, and at the end you, you raised your glass, and that was being provocative. But yes, doesn't that provocation have consequences? I mean, if you look in the country right now, hate crimes are up significantly, and it's a clear line from like the type of stuff that you're talking about to violence showing up. Like, I don't think that you are it's advocating violence. Hold on, let me, let, let, me, let me say this. I don't think that you are specifically advocating for violence. I don't believe that you are in front of audiences telling people to go out and, and do something crazy. But I believe that when you start talking about, um, when you look at the world through a white nationalist lens, and you are gathered in a group of young white nationalists, and you are getting everybody amped up and you're raising your glass and you're saying hail Trump and people are giving you the hail sig signal there are direct lines from that type of behavior into the violence that, that manifests in other parts of the country I actually fundamentally disagree with you and I would actually say that the opposite is the case the fact is when people when, when people have a suppressed identity, and, and I'm referring to white people, when they are not allowed to, 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 to express their sense of themselves, their sense of but their, their, their extended family, and so on in the real world, who is suppressing I could white imagine people in America? them. I don't, I, don't, I don't see, like, like as, as an African-American man, like, everywhere I go, I see white people. In everything I do, I see white people. In every uh, interaction I have, I see, I white, see identity. white identity. People. No, I, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm, just, Look, I, I'm, I'm sorry, that was, a, that was a little bit of a joke. I get what you're saying. This is a white country. It is like, a white, yes, it's, it is a, at, it this point, at this point, this is a majority white country. But what I'm saying is that when you look at the power in the United States... The power is consolidated with white people. So, if the where power, is the, where where does where which direction is that pointed? I look. I I, I always try to find common oh, ground with people that I I get in a you know debate with. I agree with you unquestionably. White people have a tremendous amount of power. We still have we still benefit from it. We still have plenty of wealth. We still have plenty of influence. But we are bringing about our own demise. I don't really blame black people for this. I I really don't. I blame ourselves. We are bringing about our own demise. We are removing ourselves from cultural and social power. The you know if you say white people have a lot of accumulated a lot of wealth, yes. Where is that arrow pointing? Which direction are we headed? It is towards the loss of power for my people in North America and around the world. So yes, like it, this was our country. That's why it feels pretty white. But where is it going? That's just a small sliver of my interview with Richard Spencer back in March. You can listen to more from the interview, including a discussion of how Richard Spencer gets his funding on our website. As you can hear, I couldn't really get an answer from Spencer about who was suppressing white people in America. But after the protests in Charlottesville, Spencer said those protests were the first time he had felt oppressed by his own government. How is the federal government treating white supremacists these days? 
about when it comes to violence from white nationalist groups and the extreme right? Attorney General Jeff Sessions called the car attack in Charlottesville an act of domestic terrorism. But the next day, the president had this to say to the press. Two questions. Was this terrorism? And can you tell us what you're feeling about your chief strategist? Well, I think the driver of the car is a disgrace to himself, his family, and this country. And that is, you can call it terrorism. You can call it murder. You can call it whatever you want. Words matter. Trump and his advisors have routinely failed to call out domestic right-wing terrorism. There's no such thing as a lone wolf. You do know that. That was a phrase invented by the last administration to make Americans stupid. That's White House aide Sebastian Gorka. In an interview on MSNBC, just a few days before James Alex Fields drove his car into a crowd of people. There's never been a serious attack or a serious plot that was unconnected from ISIS or Al-Qaeda. There's a problem with that statement. It's simply not true. We examined the numbers behind attacks on U.S. soil in collaboration with our partners at the Investigative Fund. Here's what we found. In the nine years we studied, right-wing extremists were responsible for nearly twice as many domestic terrorism incidents as those who claimed to act in the name of Islam. This is terrorism expert Daryl Johnson. I've got 25 years of working in the U.S. government as an intelligence analyst looking at counterterrorism issues and specifically 15 plus years looking at domestic terrorism. We spoke to Daryl for a show we did earlier this year. And what he told us is even more potent now in the context of what happened in Charlottesville. Typically, uh, during Republican administrations, we see kind of the far right dialing back on its activities and the group counts uh, decreasing. Uh, just the opposite is happening this time around, and this is the first time uh, where I've seen uh, the far right continuing its high level of activities that was built up during the Obama administration and continuing it during the Trump administration. Oh, and so far, 2017, it's been a very active year. Why should we be more focused on domestic terrorism here when we see the threat of Islamic extremists just over the horizon? I don't want to diminish the threat from ISIS and al-Qaeda. Uh, my point is, is the number of resources that the federal government deploys to domestic non-Islamic extremism pales in comparison to the amount of resources being devoted to foreign terrorists either coming here or those who are radicalizing within the United States that affiliate with ISIS and al-Qaeda. I just think that the resources are out of balance. Oh, I think that... So uh, our national leaders, as well as federal law enforcement, uh, particularly the FBI, does not call out uh, a terrorist act by a white person as often as they do for a, ma a Muslim individual. And so it, they kind of diminish the threat by not recognizing it, not talking about it, not devoting enough resources to it. The level of activity is increasing and the number of deaths has piled up. And we still haven't really made much headway as far as, you know, at least recognizing that these acts are ideologically motivated violence, that it's terrorism. Uh, a lot of times people just dismiss it as the act of a crazed gunman or diminish it by saying it's just a hate crime, not saying that hate crimes aren't, uh, you know, serious crimes. But when you say that, you don't use the terrorism word, you don't label it as terrorism, so people don't think that it is terrorism. So you've been looking at this stuff for a really long time. Tell me, what's the picture in your head of a domestic terrorist? Like, who does it tend to be? Well, here in America, we have some uniquely American extremists that have established movements. Uh, people know about the Ku Klux Klan. You've heard about the militia movement. Uh, we also have, you know, the Army of God, a, a, basically an anti-abortion terrorist group. So they're primarily white males. Uh, we do have some females that are in the movements, uh, but it's primarily a white male movement. People in their, you know, 20s, uh, 30s, uh, that tends to be kind of the primary demographic we're talking about. If I'm an American citizen, is the threat bigger for me from Islamic extremists or is the threat bigger for me from right-wing extremists? If you live in a big city like New York or Washington, D.C., uh, you're probably not going to come across too many domestic uh, non-Islamic terrorists. Uh, those cities are, you know, 
rank high on the target list for ISIS and Al Qaeda. Uh, so the police uh, that are there need to be on the lookout for those types of threats. Um, but a vast majority of Americans live around small cities or even larger cities that are, you know, surrounded by miles and miles of rural farmland like Kansas City, Missouri, uh, where the threat there is more likely to come from a domestic terrorist that's not associated with Islam. Uh, it's interesting, too, that in 2015, uh, Duke University conducted a survey among law enforcement agencies across the country to say which threat keeps you up at night, you know, what threat uh, is the one that you're most concerned about. And overwhelmingly, police departments across the country said it was the anti-government extremist uh, was what they were most worried about in their jurisdiction. So what do you think needs to change in how we as a country respond to domestic terrorism? Well, the first thing we need to do is, is understand what the threat is and to recognize it when it happens. Uh, this is very important, not only for educating you know, the American public and developing policies and strategies to protect the American public, but it's also important for people in government, uh, analysts like myself or police officers, uh, so that they can truly understand uh, what the threat is and to learn more about it and to learn how to mitigate it. So that's one thing we can do. Uh, the second thing is I think there needs to be a lot more training uh, for state and local law enforcement agencies about these types of groups and threats from, you know, domestic terrorists. Uh, there was a pretty good program that was put together in the aftermath of the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing called SLAT. It's called State Local Anti-Terrorism Training. This was like the preeminent law enforcement training to learn about domestic terrorist groups. And unfortunately, uh, in the fall of last year, uh, the Department of Justice pulled the funding for that program, and so there is this, you know, void in knowledge uh, out there. What about from the top? What does Trump need to do to, to help this? Well, again, our national leaders, from the president on down to the, you know, department heads that cover terrorism issues, uh, they need to recognize this threat, and when it, we have an incident, to condemn it and call it out as an act of terrorism. Is this the continuation of the Obama era policy, or is this something new? This is something new. Um, at least Obama recognized the threat, even though I think uh, many of his uh, cabinet members looked at Muslim terrorism as the only threat. But at least when they had you know, their summits on countering violent extremism, they tried to talk or at least include other forms of extremism. Uh, here, you just have an outright rejection and, and failure to even acknowledge that there is a threat. You know, President Trump wanted to rebrand the countering violent extremism uh, efforts by labeling it countering Muslim extremism. So all that does is by changing that brand is you've basically acknowledged that you're going to be looking at Muslim extremists at the expense of other types of threats. Daryl, thank you so much for coming in today. We really appreciate you. Hey, you're welcome. Daryl Johnson was a senior analyst at the Department of Homeland Security and now runs DT Analytics, a private firm that monitors domestic terrorism for law enforcement and academics. As we've heard, domestic terror groups often fill their ranks with young white men in their 20s and 30s. Most of them find it difficult to leave behind their life of violence. Coming up, we meet one who did. I'd never met a Jewish person and had a conversation with them. I'd never had a meaningful dialogue with an African-American. So it was easy to hate the people that I didn't humanize. But once I began to humanize them and realized that we had more similarities than differences, well, I just couldn't reconcile the hate or the prejudice anymore. Next on Reveal, from the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. So I go home and I tell my mother, and I say, Mom, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to work um, to clean up hazardous waste. I'm going to be an engineer. My grandmother said, baby, why do you want to work on a train? Join us next time for the Moth Radio Hour, true stories told live from the public radio exchange, PRX.org. This afternoon at 2, here on WGBH Radio.
Oh, she's such a hideous mess. Our funding comes from our listeners and SNH Construction. WGBH lends quality to SNH Construction's name. Doug Hanna, co founder. GBH has a stellar reputation as a creator of high quality mm -hmm. programs. All right, to anybody who's tuning in right now to actually watch me paint Leslie Jones, I know she sucks. This really sucks. I'm reconstructing the face, reconstructing the hands eventually, because it's just a hideous mess, and I'm embarrassed by it. But, you know, it's part of being an artist. You don't get it right the first time. You just keep trying. That's all. And we're listening to WGBH out of Boston while I fix this poor woman's face. <laughs> She's so amateurish. Working on it. Wellesley Hospital is proud to sponsor the 89.7 WGBH online stream. More at nwh.org. Chicago in the mid-1960s. But as a teen who was bullied and didn't have friends, he didn't feel like he had much of a family or an identity. And one day at 14 years old in 1987, I was standing in an alley and uh, a man came up to me and he essentially promised me paradise. He promised me that I wouldn't feel powerless anymore. That man was Clark Martell, founder of the Chicago area skinheads. He promised me that I had something to be proud of and that uh, if I were to join him, that I could leave a mark on the world and, and, you know, find my purpose. He said that he promised to, like, show you the world and you wouldn't feel alone and, and those type of things. Did he deliver on that promise? You know, at first he did. At first, it, you know, the bullies would stop bullying me. Uh, in fact, they started to cross the street when I would walk by, so they were afraid of me after I shaved my head and wore my boots. By the age of 16, Christian was a leader of the Chicago area skinheads, and he merged them with a group called Hammerskin Nation, which he says is still the most violent and deadly skinhead organization in the world. What was it like uh, being a part of that group? Um, I mean, how did you... What, did it feel like a family? I mean, what's the day-to-day -day there? You know, it, 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 at first it felt like a family. There was a lot of acceptance. I mean, here are a bunch of broken people who, um, you know, enjoy each other's company because we're all broken in some way. But very, very quickly it turned into a very dysfunctional family. It was really kind of an every person for themselves uh, movement after a while uh, because there was no loyalty. There were only people with an agenda that they wanted filled and they would use other people as pawns. Christian was a skinhead in the late 80s and early 90s and over that time he saw the movement start to change. Guys didn't want to stick out in society as much. They wanted to blend in. So some stopped shaving their heads and got rid of swastika tattoos. They started wearing suits and going to college campuses. He says that's where the white supremacist movement is today, but it's only changed in public. Behind closed doors, it's still the same. Well, it starts out very benign. It starts out as something about pride, pride in our people and pride in our heritage. But I can tell you behind closed doors, and I've had this conversation, uh, it is very violent. What it turns into very, very quickly is that not only should we be proud, but we have to eliminate the enemy. Christian was a skinhead for eight years before finally getting out. It took a series of wake-up calls before he could make the break. This was one of the first. When I was uh, 19 years old, uh, with some friends drinking late one night, uh, we walked into a McDonald's restaurant, and there were a couple of black teenagers in line. And when I walked in, I screamed that it was my McDonald's and that they had to leave. And of course, because there were, you know, more of us and we were intimidating, they ran out and we decided to chase after them. And when we chased after them, one of the black teenagers, uh, as he was running across the street, pulled out a gun and started to fire at us. Um, didn't hit us and, and the gun jammed eventually. Uh, but when we caught this individual, uh, we proceeded to kick him and beat him almost to the point where you know, we were certain he was dead. Uh, but at one moment, uh, and this is a difficult thing to talk about because it's still, you know, really fresh in my memory, even 25 years later. Um, at one moment, as I was kicking him, his swollen eyes opened just barely, and they connected with mine. And I remember thinking to myself as I was kicking this individual that I was able to humanize him for just a second. I thought that it could be my brother or my mother or my father. And I saw in his way that he was pleading for his life without saying a word. And 
I would say that that's probably the last incident of violence that I had as part of the movement. And the first shock to my system where I was able to connect with somebody who was one of my victims. And uh, it's a moment that I'll never forget. How old were you when you finally got out? I was 22 years old when I finally got out. Uh, I had uh, been married and had two children at that point, and I decided that my family uh, was important to me and that the movement was something that was broken and didn't fit with my values anymore. Do you remember the the moment you quit? Like, how did that work? I mean, I, I don't know much about um, how skinheads uh, work. I, you know, I know with gangs, uh, getting out is pretty difficult. Yeah, it was difficult, and, and, and it was difficult both because it was, uh, you know, unsafe to leave. And if you leave, you not only leave with nothing, uh, but you leave with the stigma of being this racist person, even though you may have begun to have a change of heart and you may have begun to understand people and that your prejudices were... Um, you know, misunderstood even within yourself. So for many, many reasons, it's very hard. And that's actually one of the reasons why I co-founded the organization Life After Hate was to be able to help people disengage from hate groups and hateful ideologies uh, with the help of people who've been through it. Uh, we actually have 100 uh, people that we've helped disengage who are part of an online private community, functions as a support network uh, that's very active every day. And uh, things are discussed in this room that people don't, feel comfortable discussing with anybody else. How do you pull somebody away from that life? How do you open somebody's eyes? You know, my advice would be is we need to find a, a way to get to common ground. And we all have common ground. You know, even the, the most vile Nazis have common ground with, uh, you know, somebody who's a, a interested in social justice. We're all Americans. We all want security. We all want happiness. We want to be able to support our families. Uh, and we need to start there. And by the way, these are all things that we do at Life After Hate. When we work with somebody, we're not arguing with them ideologically. I'm listening. I'm listening for what the potholes are in their lives that made them deviate their path from their intended one. And it's poverty, it's unemployment, it's mental illness, it's uh, trauma and abuse and addiction. And what I do is I start filling in those potholes. I work on the person. I make them more resilient. Uh, I give them the skills that they need to compete so that they don't have yes. to blame the other uh, for what they feel is being taken away. So now that they can go out and get it themselves, there's nobody to blame but themselves if they don't get it. Uh, and then what I do is to challenge the narrative is I'll introduce introduce them to people that uh, they may have marginalized or they may think that they hate or they've kept outside of their social circle. So I may introduce a Holocaust denier to a Holocaust survivor uh, or an Islamophobe to an imam or a Muslim family, uh, which they might have dinner with, or you know, somebody who is a homophobe to an LGBTQ couple. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a pretty transformative experience to be able to make those connections and humanize the people that oftentimes you've never really had had a chance to, to have a dialogue with in the first place. How do we do the type of work that you're doing uh, in mass? Like, how do we transform what we saw in Charlottesville into something else? Well, I think we can start by, um, you know, not judging the people that we feel are wrong. Uh, now, I'm not saying that what they're saying is not wrong. It is absolutely wrong. Uh, let me be very, very clear about this. What Richard Spencer and the alt-right and the neo-Nazis are doing and saying is, is wrong. It is heinous uh, and it's abhorrent. But I think that to solve the problem, uh, we can't punch our way out of it. I don't know in the history of the world if any racist has ever been punched and all of a sudden changed their, their views. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's probably pushed them deeper in their hole and caused them to hate more. Uh, what I think we need to do is learn uh, critical thinking. We look, need to learn how to build bridges between people that you know we may have completely opposite yeah, views with. So uh, and we need to learn to also not use the same tactics that maybe some of the Nazis are using, where it's really easy to, to just say we hate them without understanding that maybe they're just as broken as we are and that we might be able to find a way to penetrate that if we just pay attention. Uh, and uh, we'll see that, you know, and often 
times, you know, what we do at Life After Hate, we've worked with hundreds of people. We employ the same method over and over where we're just trying to listen, build resiliency, and, and we've seen change over and over and over again. And I'm not talking from, you know, 17, 18-year-old kids. I'm talking uh, about hardened criminals who've done jail time, grand dragons of the KKK, skinheads with swastikas tattooed on their face, and also the 17-year-old girl who looks like, you know, she could be a cheerleader for the football team. And it's all done through uh, promoting compassion and empathy and uh, sometimes biting our tongue when, uh, you know, we want to reach across and, and shake the life out of somebody. How does the organization get its funding? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> so up, uh, up until this point, we've been completely self-funded and we've relied on the donations of people. Um, last year, we applied for our first government grant uh, with the Department of Homeland Security because we wanted to scale uh, the amount of people that could service the growing need of people that were coming to us for help. So we applied for a grant and we actually won it uh, in January, just before President Obama left office. It was a $400,000 grant. Uh, and then we were notified after the, the transition and uh, the Trump administration took office that our grant was actually being pulled. Uh, cool. And of the pool of 33 organizations that were awarded this grant that we were one of, uh, we were the only organization uh, both that was rescinded the grant uh, and also the only organization that focused uh, on white extremism. I'm sorry, I'm just taking all that in. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, wow. Um, as uh, Trump was campaigning, as someone that has, you know, seen the, the dark side of, of white supremacy, so to speak, did you hear dog whistles when Trump was campaigning? Did you feel like there's trouble coming here? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I heard dog whistles all throughout the campaign and even as recent as, you know, two days ago. Um, you know, we were hearing things and, and to somebody who's been there and understands it uh, very well, uh, you know, it was loud and clear to me when they were talking about globalists. Uh, you know, we knew that that was just their new word for what they considered the global Jewish conspiracy. When they were pointing fingers and attacking the liberal media, we knew that they were talking about the Jewish media uh, because they've learned to just massage the message, change the words, make them just a little bit more palatable to the masses. How big is this problem? I think that, you know, I interviewed Sebastian Gorka mm. and he basically made light of the fact that white supremacy is, is happening in America. I, I interviewed uh, Roger Stone and Roger Stone told me that basically that there is no white supremacist. Um, you know, there's just fringe people. Like, it's not a lot of people. And so I, my question is, um, how big is it? Well, I, you know, I would love Sebastian Gorka to call the families uh, of the nine people who were killed in Charleston and explain to them that white racism doesn't exist or to call the family of, of uh, the young woman who was run over in Charlottesville and tell them that white supremacy doesn't exist in our country or to call and talk to the families of, of uh, the people who were killed in the Sikh temple shooting in Oak Creek, Wisconsin or the hundreds of other unreported or underreported hate crimes uh, that happen in our country every day and explain to them that racism doesn't exist in the United States when in fact our country from the very beginning was built on white supremacist ideals and many of those same systems exist today in our law enforcement and in our justice system and in our prisons and in our education system. So for somebody to say that white supremacy doesn't exist in our country would tell me that they're complicit in that white supremacy. Last question for you, and again, thank you so much. Um, what are the type of calls that you're getting now, like to get out? Like who's reaching out to you? Oh, we've got so many different types of people that are reaching out to us, young and old, uh, male and female, all right, and, and KKK. Uh, but one thing I can tell you that I think you'll find interesting is that before the election, we were getting maybe one to four requests a week for people uh, for help. And uh, after the election, we started uh, almost immediately getting four or five a day. Uh, and that's tapered off just a little bit, but we are still at a clip level of about two or three a day that we're receiving from people. And certainly within the last couple of days, it's spiked a bit. And are, are these uh, family members? You know, it's it's about, it's cut into thirds, I would say. Uh, about a third is, is people asking for help for themselves. Uh, the other third, the other bucket is family members or bystanders, could be co-workers, friends, loved ones of somebody that they're concerned about. Uh, and then the third is the former, the person like me who 
managed to find their way out but has never been able to talk about it and for years maybe has thought they were the only person in the world who you know is going through this and what we do for them is is provide a really amazing support network of other people who are just like them so that they can oftentimes for the first time in their lives talk about this this period that uh, is traumatic to them uh, and uh, it's really an amazing group of people that we've assembled all right my friend well listen thanks for the work you do my pleasure Christian Picciolini is a former skinhead who now runs the group Life After Hate. It seems like ancient history now, but when Donald Trump was running for office, we here at Reveal, like a lot of other people, began to notice a trend. Trump wasn't just igniting the Republican base. There was a darker side rising to the surface. White supremacists, the alt-right, whatever the latest title they're using. But this is nothing new. They've always been there. After Trump won, I started doing these one-on-one interviews to understand America in the age of Trump. And in those conversations, time and time again, we'd come back to race because in America, it always does. It's just that some people have the privilege to not see it or to acknowledge it. Charlottesville isn't the first clash that forced the nation to pay attention to race. But what may be different this time is the man in the White House, whose rise to power emboldened the white supremacist movement. The president says both sides are to blame, but that is a false equivalency. One group came armed to the teeth with torches and an ideology of hate that wants America to become a white ethnostate. And others, like Heather Heyer, were there to take a stand and say this is not the America we want. Now there's a stark difference between these two. And if the president of the United States cannot make that distinction, then it's the responsibility of citizens like you and me to do it for him. from an occasional series I've been doing called Outlets and Reveals. Now, these are one-on-one interviews between me and people making news. You can check them out by subscribing to our podcast at revealnews.org slash podcast. Also, if you have ideas about who I should talk to next, hit me up on Twitter. I'm Al underscore Letson. Our show today was edited by Taki Telenitis, Kevin Sullivan, and Cheryl Duvall. It was produced by Nina Satija, Michael Schiller, Fernanda Camarena, and Emily Harris, with help from Aaron Sankin and Mwenda Hasey. Our sound design team is the Wonder Twins, my man, Jay Breezy, Mr. Jim Briggs, and Claire C. Note Mullen, with help from Catherine Raimondo. Our head of studio is Krista Scharfenberg. Amy Powell is our editor-in-chief. Suzanne Reber is our executive editor. And our executive producer is Kevin Sullivan. Our theme music is by Camarado Lightning. Support for reveals provided by the Reeve and David Logan Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Heising Simons Foundation, and the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. Reveal is a co-production of the Center for Investigative Reporting and PRX. I'm Al Letson, and remember, there is always more to the story. How long I've been up here? Uh, it's probably been well, at least 45 minutes. Anyway, uh, it's really hard to see with this camera and this camera angle, but I've um, con- I'm in the middle of reconstructing Leslie Jones's face. I've lifted her uh, nose. I've lifted her mouth. I've re- repositioned her neck a bit. Um, I've repositioned her arms, which you can't really tell, uh, through lines that are mainly notations in, for me in my, my head to remember. But it's been a lot of lifting, a lot of shifting. Um, I think I have to lower her mouth just a tad. But I'm totally reconstructing her. She's had cross eyes. She's had eyes that are too big, too small. But um, 
several months ago when I had started her, or I thought she was done, she looked like Barbie. She looked like an African-American Barbie, and it was really embarrassing and horrible, and a friend of mine pointed it out, and he actually did illustrations through Facebook showing me how, you know, her face should be shaped, or how it would mimic her face. So that was a big wake-up call to me. Um, but today, it, she's been pulled out of storage so that I can fix her, and I am absolutely determined to fix her. And what's nice is, even as off as she is right now and as wrong as she is right now, I'm finding that whole new, deeper dimension to her face. Not that hand, which is just hideous, but to, to her face, which is going to extend out into this background and then going to extend into her hands. Jeepers, crow. Um, anyway, that's what I'm working on, and finally, it looks like news-ish programs are over, and we're going to The Moth on WGBH. The Moth is a storytelling show, and people get up on stage and, and compete to be on The Moth, so this will be nice. A nice break from listening to talks about Boston and, and Charlottesville and, and uh, you know, the violence and racism and absolute <sighs> hatred and, you know, the change in ideas and the coming of our future. Listen to the moth. First we'll get the news and then we'll get the Cambridge Savings Bank is proud to sponsor the 89.7 WGBH online stream. More at cambridgesavings.com. Pino in British governments after the van plowed into pedestrians on Las Ramblas. But Catalan authorities said they had accounted for all of the dead. And some British and Spanish news outlets erroneously reported the boy was alive in another hospital. Catalan emergency services now say the young boy's body has been positively identified. His mother remains hospitalized in serious condition. Soraya Sarhadi Nelson, NPR News, Barcelona. Iraq's Prime Minister says a battle is now underway to drive ISIS out of Tal Afar, one of the last pockets of Islamic State territory in Iraq. And Pierre's Peter Kenyon reports U.S.-backed forces and Shiite militias are carrying out the operation. In a televised address, Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi says ISIS militants have a clear choice, surrender or die. The city of Tal Afar is 35 miles east of Mosul, where a grueling nine-month battle ended in July with ISIS fighters being forced out. Much of Tal Afar's Sunni Muslim majority population has fled since ISIS took control of the city three years ago. But the large presence of Shiite militias outside the city has raised concerns of sectarian violence during or after the operation to oust ISIS. In advance of the ground operation, Iraqi warplanes have bombed the city and leaflets have been dropped warning of the coming fight. Estimates of remaining ISIS fighters in the city have ranged from 1 to 2,000. Peter Kenyon, NPR News, Istanbul. Zimbabwe's first lady is back home from Johannesburg. She faced an assault charge in South Africa. But Peter Granitz reports Pretoria has granted her diplomatic immunity. Grace Mugabe left South Africa with her husband, President Robert Mugabe, from a South African Air Force base early Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. Been... Nope. I'm going to put this out on Twitter. Awful. Let's go with that. Why did she look so bland? Actually, that helps. 
Okay. I'm gonna go make some coffee. Nobody's watching anyway. generations of black comedians and social commentators. He died yesterday in Washington, D.C. at the age of 84. I'm Barbara Klein, NPR News in Washington. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Baird. Employee-owned and independent, Baird has kept clients' financial interests first since 1919. rwbaird.com has more information. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation at rwjf.org. From PRX, this is the Moth Radio Hour. I'm Jennifer Hickson, senior producer at The Moth, and I'll be your host this time. The Moth is unscripted true tales told by regular people and raconteurs. This hour, we have four stories for you. We'll hear about the ground rules for working at a suicide hotline, some online wedding contest shenanigans, the long life of sibling rivalry, and some backstory on how Hurricane Katrina shaped the administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, Lisa Jackson. This first story is from Brian Finkelstein. He's been telling stories and hosting for The Moth for about a decade. The story takes place at a suicide hotline, and while it's not graphic in any way, it may not be appropriate for all ages. Some names have been changed to protect anonymity. Here's Brian Finkelstein, live at The Moth. So, uh, the standard commitment to work at the humanitarian suicide hotline is six months. Most people work six months and then they leave quickly. Um, some people volunteer, like a few make it a year. Nobody really goes beyond a year. Uh, I was a volunteer there for four years. Um, it started when I was uh, 22 years old and I was young and I believed in things because I was 22. And I thought maybe I could help the world. I wanted to help people because I was young enough to believe I could uh, or that if I could that I would want to. Um, I was that age, and so I decided I was going to be a psychiatrist, a psychologist. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. But the problem was, I was a 22-year-old freshman at Queens College, um, which if you know Queens, it's not a great college. It's in Flushing, New York. It's not a nice place. And um, my GPA was uh, a 2.0. Uh, 2.0. So, I, and I was 22. So I was going to have some problems getting into a master's program, which is very competitive for clinical psychology. So I decided I needed some work credit, internship, something to help me out, some leverage. So I decided to volunteer at the Humanitarian Suicide Hotline. So I show up one Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, or Saturday uh, at 8 a.m., and I walk into this church on the Upper West Side, Manhattan, and I walk inside, and there's a bunch of people milling about, but I see this guy that's clearly the guy in charge. He's sitting on the desk. He's sort of like an ex-hippie turned a little corporate. He's got like a flannel shirt tucked into khaki pants. You know what I mean? He's, he's dipping uh, a chamomile tea bag into an NPR cup. I know who this guy is. <laughs> I get it. He's a vegan who drives a BMW. I know it. So uh, clearly he's in charge. He tells us his name is Glenn. He's like, hey, check it out. All right, my name's Glenn. Um, and then he thanks us all for coming and says, hey, even though we're in a church, you know, I just want you to know we're not affiliated with any sort of religion or God. Or So if you're here for that, let me just say straight out, if you're here for God or any sort of politics or religion, you should leave now. Um, and right then, like some old dude in the back just goes, see ya, and walks out the door. And then he sits down, and even though he's got this, like, corporate Jewish metrosexual hippie thing going on, he's also got a little bit of a Lewis Gossett Jr. drill sergeant thing going on. Because as soon as he starts a training class, people, he's starting to weed people out. People start dropping. Um, there was this one guy who uh, was sitting in the back of the class and was drinking a 40 of beer. Uh, the class, I should say, was at 8 a.m. again, just to point that out. So he was gone. There were these two teenage dudes from Queens who, every time they talked, they were like, hey, bag, and then they'd high-five. 
they were gone. There was a woman who did a mock phone call with Glenn, because in a two-week training class, he did mock phone calls where he pretended to be callers, and Glenn was pretending to be this 70-year-old dude who uh, was HIV positive and had just found out he had AIDS and was very upset. And he was talking to this woman, um, Nancy, and he was, you know, Nancy was doing the phone call, and she goes, well, I just want you to know that's very upsetting. I'm very sorry for you, but you did choose this lifestyle, so... <laughs> One of the most important things Glenn weeded out, uh, he said, was people who were there because uh, they were either suicide survivors, meaning people whose family members, uh, they've lost somebody because of suicide, or because they themselves, uh, the volunteer, had uh, contemplated or tried to commit suicide. And as Glenn would say, yeah, check it out. You're really not a good fit. Gone. And so they would leave. At the end of uh, two weeks of training, out of 58 people who came to volunteer, there was only four of us left. Because Glenn was really good, but I will tell you right now, I was better. Because what Glenn didn't know about me was that about four years before this, I lived in San Diego, California. And I bet you Glenn never knew that when I lived in San Diego, I was dating this girl, Tracy. And Tracy was addicted to meth. And I was addicted to Tracy. So Tracy would try to do the meth. I would try to do her. Neither one of us would ever be satisfied. That's addiction. So, one day... Tracy uh, slept with uh, my best friend, Babyface, a guy who looked like Morrissey. That's probably why she slept with him, because she was into that. She slept with him, and I had it. And I bet you Glenn didn't know that I then jumped in my five-speed puke orange VW fastback and awesome car, and I drove up to my dad's house in Del Mar, California. I was living in uh, San Diego, and I went into his garage, and I took his 38, because my father's a retired cop, and I bet you Glenn has no idea that a 38 doesn't have one of those clips that you put in. It's got the thing, and you put the bullets in, and you snap it, and it's really easy, even if you don't know how to use guns. And I grabbed a bottle of uh, tequila out of my father's liquor cabinet, and I got in my car, and I drove to Torrey Pines Beach, and I took the gun and I drank about a half a bottle of tequila. And I bet you Glenn has no idea that a gun like that is really easy because if you pull the hammer back, it's just, it sort of like has a hairpin, like you can just tap it and it's going to go off. And I took the gun and I stuck it in my mouth. And I'll bet you Glenn has no idea how good it feels to stick a loaded gun in your mouth. It feels incredibly good. I'm not, look, I, I'm things, I'm not a hanser. Things aren't going good for me. I'm, I'm just pointing it out. Like it, just saying it right now in front, it feels good to to have control, to say, like, I'm going to put a gun in my mouth, and I'm going to have some control over something. And I sat there, and I put the gun, and I was trying to contemplate doing it, and then tequila uh, makes me a little dramatic, and uh, I threw up. Uh, I, I, I'm not a good drinker. I want to be I want to be the guy that drinks a bottle of tequila, but it's not me. I'm not Bukowski. I'm, I'm Dr. Phil. And uh, I threw up all over the gun. And, and, <laughs> And there's, there's nothing that sort of snaps you out of a suicide uh, impulse than throwing up on a gun. I, it's, it's, it really just sort of clears your head. And I took the gun out, and I thought to myself, well, at least I know I'm not the type of person that's going to pull the trigger, which I don't know. How, for me, it's something I had to find out um, that way. And it also snapped me out of the suicide, and I felt really good, and I felt like this moment of clarity, and I, I wiped the throw up off me, and I got out of my car, and I went, I was in Torrey Pines, a uh, beautiful beach, and I, I went to the water, it was late at night, beautiful full moon, and I went in the water, and it was like perfect, and I had what for me was a perfect life moment. I sat there under the full moon, in the water, just feeling really good, the waves sort of washing over, and I realized that's what life is. That's enough for me, because there's these moments of beauty, like moons and oceans, and then there's moments of horror, and then it's good again. And then it's horrible and kicks you in the face. And then it's good again. And then it's horrible and a pigsty because that's what life is. But then for a moment, it's good. And for me, that's enough. But I bet you Glenn didn't know any of that because I never told him. So at the end of two weeks of training class, out of a series of uh, 58 people, uh, four of us are left. Now we walk into the training room and there's a, the, 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 the hotline room. Uh, just to give you an idea what it looks like, there's three desks with phones. There's a couple plants. Um, and there's a couple things uh, that hang on the walls. There's a, a list of phone numbers. There's um, Glenn's home number in case you need him. There's poison control. Um, and then there's 911 uh, in case you forget what 911 the number for. <laughs> Shouldn't have to write that down. Um, and then there's a sign that hangs on the wall that says the motto of the hotline, which is shut up and listen. Big block letters, shut up and listen. Mm. And that is an amazing expression to me. That is, that is exactly why I stayed there for four years. Because after six months, I got my certificate. I was free to leave. But I ended up staying for four years because of that thing. Because it made me feel good um, to work there for two reasons. One, listening to people's problems on the phone, you start to feel to yourself, you know what? I don't have it so bad. These people have it a lot worse. And to me, it's like if you go to the park and you sit on a bench and you look down and you see a squirrel and you say, well, at least I'm not a squirrel. 
you know what I mean? It's something. <laughs> and two, seeing the sign shut up and listen, it, it's how you do prevent suicides. It's, it, it, it's what you do is by listening to people. We can't, we don't listen to each other. We, we have agendas, it makes sense. We, whether it's somebody you love or relationship or people you don't like or just casual, we, we all have agendas. We're all trying to get something and we like to talk. I, I clearly like to talk a lot about myself. I'm up here. But the idea of sitting and listening to somebody else talk made me feel good and it made me feel like I was helping. And that's why I stayed for four years. Now, the way, the, 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 the training basically says that what you do is you answer the call, you say humanitarian suicide hotline, thanks for calling. You then um, listen to somebody, be an active listener. You have to be an active listener. Glenn said not to get scared of silence if there was silence on the phone because, check it out, silence is a form of communication, right on. Mm -hmm. He also said that you can't get manipulated by silence. So if it lasts five minutes, you gotta you gotta hang up the phone. Don't get manipulated. At the end of twelve minutes, end the call because that's about the the, the a lot of time. And before you enter the call, you had to evaluate the person's level of suicide. And the way you do that is you ask a series of four questions. One, um, do you so, feel so bad that you think about suicide? Two, um, do you have a plan for how you would do it? Three, have you set a time for when you're going to do that? And four, have you taken any steps today to kill yourself? Now, in the four years I worked there, 99.9% .9 of all calls are yes, no, no, no. A lot of people think about suicide, but a lot of people don't really go the next step. And what he said is the only thing that he would offer as a bit of advice was the, the, the biggest, clearest thing, a warning sign, that the closest thing to a warning sign that you can have for suicide is if somebody says something like, I don't want to die, I just want the pain to stop. And if you hear somebody say that, that they want the pain to stop, that is about, a bell should go off. That's a person who's, who's on the edge. So, four years later, I'm working at the hotline. I come in for the overnight shift. I walk in there. Uh, it's me and my shift partner, a guy named Adam. Adam's a communist. Not relevant at all to the story. It's just a little detail. You're welcome. So... Me and Adam are working the overnight shift, and it's busy till about, the overnight shift's 11 uh, to 8, 11 to 9 to 8 in the morning, you have to do one a year, um, or one a month, and uh, it, it's busy till like 4 a.m., till the bars close in New York, and then it sort of slows down, and uh, it gets slow. Um, and around 4 o'clock, uh, it was, you know, uh, Adam, it was my turn to answer the phone, and the phone rings, and I pick it up. And uh, I say, hello, humanitarians, can I help you? And this very young, cute, scared voice comes on the phone and says, hi, my name's Amy, I'd like to talk. And I said, what's up, Amy? What's going on? And she says, oh, nothing. I was just, you know, calling because I was feeling a little sad. And I was like, oh, what are you, what are you sad about? She goes, ah, I, I don't know. I, things are pretty good. You know, I have good grades at school and my parents don't get it, but they, they love me. And, you know, I've got a friend back in Tennessee where I'm from and, you know, NYU's good. I have good friends here. I have friends who are... She said she had two types of friends, which I thought was really funny, and I use it all the time, is that she had uh, bar friends, and then she had movie friends. I like that expression. I wish I had some movie friends, but so be it. <laughs> and right away, I pictured her the way you do when you talk to somebody on the phone. I pictured her in her dorm room, and I pictured, like, a, a quilt, and I pictured her with, like, long hair sitting on her bed, and, like, uh, rollerblades, and, like, a Dr. Pepper, you know what I mean? I got her figured out. And so I said, well, that sounds good. What's, you, but you said you were sad. What do you think about when that happens? She goes, I don't know. And she goes, I can't, I don't understand what happens. I can't control it. She goes, sometimes when I have a great day, what I do the next day is I try to duplicate it. I wake up at the same time. I try to eat the same food, try to have the same pattern so that I can control the day so that I don't feel bad. But then out of nowhere, she said she feels what she described as a hand coming from behind her and sort of pushing her down. I said, okay, well, what, what's going on when that happens? What are you thinking about? And she goes, ah, oh, everything, nothing. I don't know. This feels so stupid. She, you know, she started to feel uncomfortable. And then we sort of started to, I don't know, we started to flirt, a little, like not in an inappropriate way, but there was like a, there was a, look, a lot of the callers I talked to over the years were crazy. This was, she could have been a movie friend if I had met her some other situation. So it wasn't inappropriate, but I was talking to her and we talked for a little while. And then she said she felt dumb because, because of depression. She felt like, yeah, she felt this sadness. She felt this crippling sadness, but she, she thought that depression was overused as an expression and that there are people who are clinically or socially or chemically or whatever depressed but she thought maybe she was just a lot of people are lazy or overuse that word or use it as an excuse and she was worried she might be like that and I can identify I feel the same way I feel that way you know I'm, I like I don't think I get depressed I mean sure there's days where I don't get out of bed for four days but I'm not depressed right so 
we were talking like that, and then I noticed that it was about like time to wrap it up, and I was about to wrap it up, and uh, Amy starts to tell me this. She was telling me the story about going to some place with her family one day, and they went out to get ice cream, and her father bought her ice cream, and it was great. Dad, I said, oh, that's great. And I looked at the clock, and I was about to wrap it up, but then I noticed what started to happen was Amy started to slur her speech a little bit. And I said, uh, Amy, what's going on? Are you okay? And she goes, yeah. She goes, um, look, I know it's selfish, and I know it's stupid, but uh, I can't do it anymore. I just wanted to stop. And I said, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean by it? She goes, I don't know. I just, I can't. I just want you to talk to me. I was like, well, when you said it, what did you mean? She goes, look, I don't want to die. I just want the pain to stop. And I woke up. And I said, Amy, do you feel so bad that you think about suicide? And she said, yes. And I said, um, do you have a plan for how you would do it? Yes. Um, have you set a time for when you're going to do it? Uh-huh. Amy, have you taken any steps today to kill yourself? And she said, yes. And I said, Amy, what have you done? And she told me she took 20 high-strength painkillers. And I said, what kind of painkillers? Because that's what you're supposed to do. And she told me, and I wrote it down. And I threw a pencil at him, who was nodding off because he's a communist. And I handed him... I handed him the piece of paper so he could poise, call poison control so I could have some information about what would happen so I could pass it on to her. And I said, I just tried to keep Amy talking. I was like trying to ask her about like other things. And, and she was again talking about that day. Her father bought her ice cream and it was very confusing. And then Adam came back with a piece of paper. He had called poison control. And I said, Amy, given the fact that you took 20 high strength painkillers you, and that you drank and that you haven't thrown up, what she had told me, do you understand that you could pro you probably, you could die within, within an hour? And she started to cry. And I said, Amy, look, um, do you want help? Do you want me to do something? I can do something. I can only help you if you ask. Our policy was not to let, not to intervene unless people wanted. I said, if you want help, I can do something. She goes, I do. I don't want this. Is, I No, I don't want to do this. I said, great. What's your address? She gave me her address. I handed it to Adam. He went to go call 911 because the number was on the board. And I kept Amy talking. And after a while, I just tried to ask her anything. And I was like, uh, Amy, what, 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 what kind of ice cream was it that your father bought? You mentioned that your father bought you ice cream. What kind of ice cream was it? But it was silent. And it was silent for two minutes. And it was silent for five minutes. And I'm supposed to hang up the phone, but who the hell could hang up the phone? So I didn't. And then it was seven minutes. And then around 13, 14 minutes, there was, I heard noises at the door because Adam had called 911 and I heard like people knocking and then I heard the door crash open. I heard footsteps and then I heard this voice come on the phone and said, it's okay. We've got her. Click. And then I went home. And... I was supposed to go to class that day. I had classes at Queens College, but I didn't go back to Queens College. I never went back to Queens College. I never graduated. I was supposed to go back to the hotline uh, for a debriefing based on that phone call. I called Glenn and told him I quit, that I wasn't coming back. But check it out. Click. And then I did all the things you're not supposed to do in that situation. I obsessed about it, and I stayed up, and I drank, and I smoked, and I drank coffee, and I searched. It wasn't the internet, but I looked through the papers and listened to the radio. And finally, after three days of it, I uh, found on the Daily News, uh, in the Daily News in New York, page 23, a small paragraph that said um, uh, that they had found the body of a 23-year-old NYU oh. student named Amy Walters um, who died of an accidental overdose. And I know why they call it accidental. I get it. There's insurance reasons, religious reasons, family. They don't want an epidemic to start in a college. I get all that. But what I didn't know was that I was, until that moment, that I was the last person to talk to her. Not her mom in Tennessee or her best friend or some boy at NYU who probably had a crush on her that never talked to her and probably, no, me. And I wanted to call her family, and I wanted to try to go down the funeral, but I, did. I knew it was inappropriate, and so I didn't. And the thing of it is, for me, I have had pers bigger personal tragedies over the years. I think we all have. People do. I, I spoke to her for less than an hour 20 years ago. But she's me in that car, and I think about it every day. If I had pulled that trigger... That's would be me. And she never got to find out what I got to find out, which is, it's terrible sometimes, but there are these perfect life moments. And that's enough. Thank you. That was Brian Finkelstein. The solo show, first day off in a long time, which includes parts of the story you just heard, was featured at the HBO US Comedy Arts Festival. In a moment, we'll be back with Brian Finkelstein to talk about the Moth Story Slam, which Brian hosts in Los Angeles. Also, two slam stories, 
One about a couple's quest to win a dream wedding online, and another about two sisters with very different children. The Moth is supported by Fox Searchlight, presenting Step, the real-life story of a girl's high school step dance team in the heart of Baltimore. Empowered by their teammates, coaches, families, and counselors, they chase their ultimate dreams to win a step championship and to be accepted into college. In theaters nationwide, August 18th. The Moth Radio Hour is produced by Atlantic Public Media in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and presented by PRX. This week on Under the Radar with Callie Crossley. Women were supposed to keep their place. There were all kinds of limitations. And here was this group of, of bad girls who were taking over the building and stepping out of their place. The documentary Left on Pearl reveals the forgotten story of women activists who took a stand in Cambridge in 1971. That's Under the Radar with me, Callie Crossley, tonight at 6 here on 89.7 WGBH and the WGBH app. Support for WGBH comes from you and Boston Children's Museum, where kids can put their creativity and curiosity to work. Hands-on exhibits, science, art, music, and games. Boston Children's Museum on Fort Point Channel at the entrance to the Seaport District. And Sarepta Therapeutics, a commercial stage biopharmaceutical company focused on the discovery and development of unique RNA-targeted therapeutics for the treatment of rare neuromuscular diseases. This is the Moth Radio Hour from PRX. I'm Jennifer Hickson. The Moth first met Brian Finkelstein when he told a story at a Moth Story Slam at the New Yorkian Poets Cafe on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Story Slams are a competition, and judges chosen from the audience picked Brian's story as the winner. He kept coming back, and he kept winning. Eventually, we made him a host. When he decided to move out west, we realized that maybe the time had come to take the Story Slams to another city. That was 2006. Brian has been hosting in Los Angeles ever since. I love it. I love hosting it. It's still, like, I look forward to it every time I do it. Hosting is a huge part of each Story Slam. There are ten stories, and the host keeps the energy up and keeps the show moving. Because the hosts often comment and riff on the stories, they listen especially carefully. And what do you, what do you think makes for a winning story? Some people are really good at crafting a minutia, a small thing, into a big story by being, like, a good storyteller. And then some people are maybe not the best storytellers, but they have these crazy things that happen to them that are completely unique, but somehow still universal, which I, I guess that's what makes it good. But I think both are valid. I think the small one told well is interesting, and I think the amazing thing just blurted out is also as interesting. I know it is an equal opportunity um, art in that way. I feel like everybody's kind of qualified to, to rock it. Um, yeah, I feel that way too. I mean, I, I will say that because I go to a lot, because I host them and I've been doing it, and I'm sure you feel this way, that my personal taste is I like the cop who just heard about the show and decided to give it a shot, or the soldier who just came back from the war, or the teacher, or, or you know, a God, I sound like a politician, like <laughs> soldiers, policemen, you know, regular people. Um, but you know what I mean? Single like mothers. <laughs> Single mothers, <laughs> babies. I like when babies tell stories. I like anyone, um, a anyone who's just not, you know, like, doing this for a just because it sounds fresh to me but I'm sure to an audience both you know both are valid it's just because when you hear a lot I, I like the you know the I'm more than the the norm then again I agree for the audience um it's sometimes great when uh, if you have a night and even if the content's great and the storytellers are a little shaky or yeah not exactly rock on tours necessarily it is kind of wonderful when someone who really has a hold of the form comes and um, just lays it out. That's really nice. And at the slam, it's so great because you're changing, you know, it's every five minutes, something new. So. Yeah. So you get that variety. And I, it is funny to watch people. And I'm sure you've definitely, cause you've been doing this slam the longest is the, the development of a person. Like some people show up and they tell a story and they win or they, you know, they have that one good story and they're not a storyteller and they win and then they come back and they tell another story. And then like over the years, some of those people become authors and like, they start to grow into this whole thing that's new for them and that's that's interesting as well yeah the non rock and tours learn from the rock and tours yeah yeah oh. steal they steal they steal <laughs> brian and i later decided that we like the phrase learn from better than steal so i hereby amend that statement if you ever visit los angeles definitely go see brian finkelstein host a moth story slam 
And now we'll hear two slam stories. This first storyteller's name is Peter Story. Yes, Story. Here he is at the Los Angeles Grand Slam, where we partner with the public radio station KCRW. The theme that night was Golden Opportunity. The fall of 2009 found me and my then fiance Megan, trying to plan a wedding. And we were unemployed, we came from humble beginnings, and no matter how much we tried to crunch the numbers or plan the most banal, menial wedding possible, it was just not going to happen. And uh, we were a little upset, you know, because we were in love and we were ready to start our life together. And uh, things were complicated because I had just gotten her to L.A. We had done a long-distance relationship across to Michigan. And I had to leave her behind. She had to stay and run our apartment complex. That was my normal job. And I had to book out to Sacramento to work as an actor in a professional theater where, ironically, we had met before. I was going to be gone for a long time. And right before I left, she said, you know, I think... I think I found a way for us to have a wedding. And I said, what? She goes, well, I found this online contest. It's called the Southern California $100,000 Dream Wedding Giveaway. I found it on a website called Broke Ass Bride. And I said, listen, I, and the skeptic, the realist, you know, came out to me and I said, listen, the fine print, you're going to read it. You're going to find out it's not really doing what it's going to do. And even if we entered it, we're going to lose to someone with a terminal illness or an Iraqi war vet. It's just going to happen. So I blew it off. I went up north. I started doing my thing. She came up and visited me a couple times. And after the holiday, she came and visited me again. She was only there until Friday. And on Friday, she said, you know, today's the last day to turn in the form for the Southern California Dream Wedding Giveaway. Please. And she coerced me into it. And I said, fine. I started filling out the form. And the perfectionist in me took over. And I kind of started getting into it, these cute questions and how you met and what's your song and all kind of stuff. And we filled it out. And like an hour before it was due, we turned it in online with over 600 other couples and I went, done. And she went back to Los Angeles. About two days later, we got a phone call. Megan called me to tell me we made the top 10 finalists. I found it right before I was going on stage in the, in the dressing room and I flipped. Because all my worry and my fear up to that point kind of dissipated because this was confirmation that there was chance. There was a chance. And there were two more rounds of the competition left to go. We had a voting round, and then there was a big party at the end that all the vendors and sponsors would go to. So we started a massive campaign. It was internet voting, and it was kind of tricky because it was only one vote per IP address. So basically, in layman's terms, it's one vote per computer. Couldn't hammer the vote vote button a hundred times. So you had to reach out to everybody. So we got a Facebook fan page and we were calling, doing bulk emails, getting a hold of teachers and relatives we hadn't talked to in years, didn't want to talk to for years, just begging anyone to vote. I was driving around with my laptop in my passenger seat of my car, pulling over in front of restaurants. I had a Wi-Fi and linking in and voting. Um, I... <laughs> I was doing a show at the end scene. I had a tuxedo, so I came out in my tuxedo to the lobby and met every patron and handed them a flyer to please vote for us. And Megan was doing her best down in L.A., but no matter how many votes we get, we couldn't top Amber and Tyler. <laughs> And Amber and Tyler were this couple that just kept pulling ahead, and they were every fear I had personified. Tyler was a firefighter battling testicular cancer. <laughs> Impossible. So we had to, you know, deep, dig deep. So I got my buddy Jacob, who was friends with Panic at the Disco, which was this huge band. And we got them to put on Twitter to tweet our link to vote, and went out to 90,000 people. Bam! Overnight. Overnight, we went from hundreds of votes down to hundreds of votes ahead. And they responded. Tyler's mom contacted the Live Strong Network, and thousands of cancer votes just started piling in. There's nothing we could do about it. We went underneath. But you know what? It wasn't over yet. There was one level left. The party. And even though we got second place in the votes, it all came down to the decision at the party. And the problem was I couldn't go. I was in Sacramento. And Megan was in Los Angeles. And I couldn't make it. I didn't have an understudy. There was no one to cover me. And my sister's putting the fear of God in me going, you got to get down there. Showing up is 90% of it. You're going to lose. And there was nothing we could do. So Megan, brilliant, cuts out huge cutouts of my face and puts them on popsicle sticks and hands them out to four of our friends that went to the party. So even though I wasn't there in body, in every photograph, I'm there in two days. <laughs> and they bring all the couples up on stage for one final kind of dating show game Q&A and they ask my wife, you know, uh, what, what do you think about uh, uh, 
Peter, what makes you think about him? And she talked about the kiss and how it felt like home, and it was beautiful, and melted people's hearts, and they went to Amber. And Tyler wasn't there because he was recovering from surgery. <laughs> and they asked Amber, what's funny about banking? Because apparently she was in banking. She goes, what's funny about banking? He goes, yeah, tell us something funny about banking. She goes, I don't think there's anything funny about banking. And she looks at her sister. Her sister freezes. Her sister looks at the MC and goes, can we have another question? She tanked. She tanked. And everyone that went to the party that night said that when it went up to her, she was a cold fish. And I just, I closed my eyes and hope. We went to bed that night. Megan went to bed. I went to a friend's house who had been with us the whole way. And he said, dude, just enjoy the journey. You lost it. They can't not give it to them. The, the public backlash from, you know, not having the cancer winner. It's just enjoy the journey. So I went to bed. Two days later, 9.30 in the morning on Valentine's Day, we got the call. And we won. <laughs> fine print was true. We got the ice sculpture and the cigar bar and the photo booth and the free dress and the tuxes and the hotel rooms and it was unbelievable. And for two kids on unemployment, it was a dream wedding. And three weeks today, we celebrate our one year anniversary. And true story, Amber and Tyler broke up. That was Peter's story. He and Megan are still going strong. To see a picture of them at their wedding, or to view some of the YouTube videos they made to secure their win, visit our Radio Extras page at themoth.org. Our next story is from the Moth Story Slam, sponsored by WBEZ in Chicago. This story also deals with competition, but of a very different sort. Here's Diane Castillo, live in Chicago. never been a particularly competitive person and when it comes to my sister it's best not to even try she is the luckiest person I have ever known always in the right place at the right time she married into money so she could buy anything she wants but she wins everything or uses points or has it bequeathed to her <laughs> she plots out her life step by step follows that plan and that works. <laughs> the, the hand of faith seemed to lovingly caress her instead of slapping her upside the head, which, as far as I know, is its job. <laughs> um, because of all this, my sister has developed a life philosophy that's simple and airtight. Good people make good choices and therefore have good lives. Mm. Now, in my circles... <laughs> circles, life is more like a series of rough drafts. So over time, my sister and I drifted apart. Um, but then we started having kids, and I thought, well, maybe this is something that will bring us together. In fact, our daughters were born within months of each other. She had twins. I just had the one. <laughs> and, and for a while, things really were better. But I soon discovered that perfect people have perfect children. My sister's daughters tested as gifted in school, were the star athletes for every sport they went out for, really talented artists, I mean, you name it. Meanwhile, my daughter was racking up labels of her own. ADD, OCD, mood disorder, you name it. It's hard to describe how toxic the effects of these challenges are on one so young and how far reaching their effects School is a nightmare. Sports are out of the question. And even extracurricular activities really just don't take. But the worst is the social ostracism. And that's the one thing that as a parent, you can do absolutely nothing about. When my daughter was 10, she mentioned suicide for the first time. And um, so we had to take her for an emergency appointment uh, with her psychiatrist. Now, I, have a, I had a the infant at the time and couldn't get a babysitter at such short notice, so I had to ask, ask my sister to help out. Now, she had a tennis game scheduled, and mm -hmm. those are sacred, so I had to really make my case and tell her, you know, what my daughter had actually said. And to my surprise, she, she was very compassionate and actually apologized for having kind of turned a blind eye to the struggles my daughter had had for years. That's okay, I told her. You know, it's so hard to know how to handle situations like this. But if you could just ask about her from time to time, you know, it'd be, it'd be such a bomb for me just to be able to talk to you about this. 
But for whatever reason, my sister never mentioned my daughter after that night and would avoid any discussion of her. The year all three girls were set to graduate from junior high school, my sister sent out an email to me and a bunch of other people in February asking us to hold the date for their graduation party. You know, like you do for weddings. <laughs> um, and uh, the email read as follows. Please hold June 10th for Amber and Tiffany's graduation from junior high school. In their three years there, uh, they have made the dean's list every single semester, typically earning straight A's. They've participated in sports year-round, usually as captain, and sometimes juggling more than one at a time. This year, they took on the additional challenge of being confirmed at our church. <laughs> Through it all, they've maintained a large group of the right friends who share their same values. Aww. Now, I love my nieces, and I'm so proud of them, but I read this email and I thought, we cannot go to this party. <laughs> achievements and awards and full of their friends and my daughter will not be able to handle it and of course neither will I so when the invitation came I threw it away I never told anybody about this not even my husband I mean what kind of person boycotts a child's party <laughs> and, and their nieces as luck would have it, my daughter found the invitation in the recycling bin and asked me about it. And I said, oh, um, we can't go because we are going to the beach that day. Now, my daughter hates the beach and was at the age where she'd argue with everything I said, but she just looked at me and didn't say a word in protest. Well, the day the party arrives, and it is lousy. It's overcast and rainy and cold. And so my husband and my other kids were like, we're not going to the beach. But my daughter astonished me by getting up early, getting food together, pulling out the beach stuff, even packing the car. So the two of us got in and drove to the beach. And we got there, and the weather was even worse, but pulled out everything, laid out the beach blanket, and sat down and watched Lake Michigan. Now, I thought my daughter would retreat into her, her iPod or maybe even just stay in the car, but to my surprise, she sat down and curled up against me. I mean, she was almost a full-grown woman at 14, and she was practically in my arms. And we just sat there and watched the water until it started to rain, and then we sat there some more. And to this day, I don't know why neither one of us made a move to leave, but I guess we're thinking the same thing. Sooner or later, this has got to stop. Yeah. Thank you. That was Diane Castillo. Diane asked us to dedicate this story to her daughter and other kids like her. Diane is a writer who's done a lot of work in the nonprofit sector, but has also completed the University of Chicago's Great Books program and studied improv at the Second City Conservatory. Have any of these stories made you think of your story and how we should put you on the radio? Well, pitch us. If you don't try, you'll never know what might have been. Call our pitch line. It takes two minutes. Record it right on our site, themoth.org, or call 877-799-MOTH. That's 877-799-6684. In a moment, our final story from the woman appointed by President Obama to head up the Environmental Protection Agency, Lisa Jackson. The Moth Radio Hour is produced by Atlantic Public Media and presented by the Public Radio Exchange, prx.org. The heart and soul of any city is its people, and those people have to eat. On Saturday, October 7th, explore the food that fuels New England at the WGBH Food and Wine Festival Artisan Taste. Attend panel discussions with the region's top chefs, converse with local vintners, and enjoy a delicious evening of culinary exploration. Secure your tickets now at wgbh.org slash events. Hey, Funding for our programs comes from you and Sunbug Solar, a full-service local solar energy installer offering consultation, design, and installation. You can find out what the sun can do for you at their new design center in Arlington or by visiting sunbugsolar.com. 
and Boston Harbor Cruises, presenting whale watches out to Stellwagen Bank, featuring naturalists certified by the New England Aquarium. BostonHarborCruises.com, 877-SEA-WHALE. This is the Moth Radio Hour from PRX. I'm Jennifer Hickson from The Moth. Our final story is from Lisa Jackson. When The Moth teamed up with the World Science Festival, we were especially thrilled to learn that Lisa Jackson agreed to tell a story for our show. She is the first presidential cabinet member we've ever had on The Moth stage. Before the show, we started wondering, who are all these tall, well-dressed men in our green room? They have walkie-talkies and earbuds and, ah, secret service. Here's Lisa Jackson, live at The Moth, at the World Science Festival. So, um, when he was done, when the war was done and his time was up, he came back home to New Orleans. I'm from New Orleans. His family had been there for generations and looked for a job. For a black man in New Orleans in the late 40s and 50s, job options boiled down to mailman, Pullman Porter, and daddy picked mailman. And so he was a postman. And, um, you know, back in the days when postmen wore their uniforms and walked through the neighborhood, and I couldn't go on the route with him, but we would walk around, and sometimes um, I have memories around Christmas waiting for him to come from his last round um, so we could go out and buy the tree or do whatever we needed to do. But he would take me from time to time, and his route included parts of the French Quarter. And I just remember um, having this feeling when I was with him. Now I think I know it was the first burgeonings of what real public service was. Because, of course, a mailman was about delivering really important things. Um, for those of you who don't remember, Social Security checks used to actually be a piece of paper. And people would wait for them. They were really important. And the mailman would always ring the doorbell on the day they came to make sure that check was in your hand, especially for poor people or people who really needed to make sure they got it. And I remember that feeling of real responsibility, of really having a role in the community that made me very proud. It was you know, no different if my dad had been the mayor. And I think that that feeling of community service stuck with me to the point where I remember once he took me to the central mail processing facility in New Orleans. <laughs> and um, I remember looking up at him adoringly at the end and saying, Daddy, I want to work for the post office. <laughs> and like any striver in the 60s, by that point it was the 60s, um, my dad looked at me and said, no, sweetheart. Um, and perhaps he had a sense of longevity and career respect by the time I would actually be doing it, I have no idea, but he of course wanted more for his baby girl. Um, so my dad passed away when I was in high school, and by that point I had moved on from a dream of being a mailman to um, a pretty clear talent for math um, and science. And so when you're the first kid to be going to college in a family and you're good at math and science, the really only one career choice that your mom can think of, and that's my baby's going to be a doctor. So my mother would say when I was valedictorian in high school, she would say, my baby is going to be a doctor. And everybody knew I was going to go to Tulane, re roll wave, Tulane. No. Um, <laughs> Um, and I was going to be a doctor. Now, I have to admit that um, this is a scientific part of the story, so you don't get worried. Um, I did, uh, when I was in high school, I went to Tulane for a summer program to find out what this thing called engineering was, because I had no idea. And I went because they were giving away a free HP programmable calculator. <laughs> So yes, there, there is nerdiness in there. But I get to Tulane and I'm still going to be a doctor. I'm going to be an engineer and be pre-med at the same time. And um, I was okay. I was doing fine. 
and then, um, but it was, it was the late 70s, early 80s, and Love Canal was the talk of the town, and Love Canal, um, for those of you who might not know, was a big dump in outside of Buffalo, New York, and it was actually a canal that was started by, name, by, by a man named Alfred Love, and he started a little bit of it, and then he lost all his money, and he stopped, and they poured um, chemical waste, industrial waste into the canal, and then they covered it over, and eventually pressure forced that waste out, and it oozed into people's basements. And I do remember thinking in, in college, if a chemical engineer, which is what I was studying to be by that time, can make the processes that make all this goop, it's going to be an engineer who figures out how to clean it up. And cleaning up that waste was um, inspired an entire federal program, our federal Superfund program. And that's when I decided to be an engineer and work on environmental issues. So I go home and I tell my mother. And I say, Ma, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to work um, to clean up hazardous waste. I'm going to be an engineer. My grandmother said, baby, why do you want to work on a train? <laughs> and um, my mother just gave me the look. If you know the look, if you have a mother from the South, um, you know you might know the look, and the look was one of, but you're going to be a doctor, right? Um, so anyway, I, I um, did believe strongly, and the more I learned about the field, that it wasn't medicine, but it certainly could make people healthier. Um, so I finished college. I actually went to graduate school at Princeton. I came out and somehow found myself in public service and uh, worked at EPA and then eventually... Oh, sorry about that. but it's okay, but it's, it's her birthday. My mom's birthday is August 27th, it's 2005, and I go home to be with her on her birthday, and um, that's a momentous period, because that's when Hurricane Katrina hit uh, the Gulf Coast, and of course, New Orleans. So I was home, I was with her, um, I drove her out. There was a Saints game on the night before. I remember distinctly not wanting to leave because I couldn't believe we had to get up after a Saints game and <laughs> leave. Um, but we did. Um, and I remember her grumbling and me grumbling and we drove up to northern Louisiana. And of course, I, I lived in the Ninth Ward and you know what happened in the Ninth Ward. We were very fortunate. Um, my immediate family, my stepdad, everybody got out. That's not true of some of our other relatives and certainly some of our friends. Um, but my mom's um, moved. So now I'm explaining to my mother and after the hurricane it becomes clear that one of the reasons, besides the fact that there's a man-made failure of engineering, the levees broke, but the other reason that a storm that shouldn't have caused the damage it did, did is because the wetlands that should have been there to protect the city were gone. They'd been cut by oil and gas lines and by years of engineering that had unintended consequences. And finally, my mother came to understand why environmental engineering is maybe better than being a doctor. I, um, Things. That's for her. See, you can learn. Um, now, net, net, so we keep moving forward. Um, so the hurricane hits, and I'm working in New Jersey, and I really had a moment where I thought, I've been in public service my whole life. It's not the highest paid career. If I had just gone and taken my talents to the private sector, I could have bought her a new house. I could have raised the one she had. I could have done so, done so many things for her. And I really had a crisis where I thought I need to leave and go make some money so I can help her. And it was my mom, because she now understood how important my job was, who convinced me to stay. And I'm glad she did. And as, as fate would have it, not too long after that, um, I became head of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And not too long after that, in 2008, came a call from President-elect Barack Obama. By the way, my mom was totally cool with that. Um, so, um, I think the most 
the, the, the most amazing moment, though, was being with my mom, um, being able to get her to Washington, D.C., and the president being the person he is, of course, wanted to meet her. And so having my mom um, in the Oval Office meeting the president of the United States, uh, embarrassing the hell out of me. <laughs> in a good way. Love your mama. And um, so she met him. She's there. She talked to him. Um, a woman who grew up in segregation in the Oval Office with the first black president of the United States and with her grandchildren. <laughs> but where I want to end my story is what happened next because I had one more surprise from my mom. And that is after we um, went, left the Oval Office, we went back to my building at 12th and Penn, four blocks away. And we got her upstairs. And I showed her um, the trappings of my office, which are, is quite beautiful. Um, but it's the offices of what were once the offices of the Postmaster General of the United States. <laughs> And you can't enter my office without passing through either door over the great seal of the Postmaster General of the United States. And the conference room I use every day is full of icons of male men, sorry, but yeah, they are all men, um, through the years. Um, it was a long time ago they did them. And it was just cool to see all the things that I think have helped make me my strong mother and my dad and my kids and my brothers. But what I said to her is what I want to leave you with. Sometimes you have an opportunity to think about all the things that influence you. And I think we all do a little bit of reverse storytelling where we make all the facts fit. But I don't think it's an accident that I'm in that building. And every day I'm there, I think about public service. Every day I'm there, I do think about the incredible importance of clean air and clean water and understanding the effects of chemicals on our bodies and our lives and our kids. But most important, every day, I think about my dad and public service. Okay. All right, well, it looks like it's only been an hour. I thought it had been closer to two, but it's only been an hour. I'm a little pooped. I'm going to stop, and I think what I'm going to do is reposition the camera, because I've been working from that angle on the way over, which is affecting the painting. So I'm going to switch places, put the camera over there, and I'll work from this side over, uh, so that it kind of balances out a bit. I've raised her... No, I didn't really raise her eyes. I did raise her eyes maybe a little bit, uh, but I've raised her mouth, I've lifted her mouth, I've lifted her nose, I've uh, repositioned line that def de lines that defined her face, um, I've extended, I pushed out rather the side of her head, the left side, the right side, pulled it in a little bit, and now I'm working on her hands. And the hands are beginning to look like another painting I've done, a portrait of the monologist and writer uh, Spalding Gray, Spud, but Spalding Gray, who was one of my favorite people in the world. He committed suicide several years ago. Um, oh, fingerprints. Oh, God. I can see my nail print in just about every brush when I put my glasses up. Anyway, um, you know, with the colorization, the blocking of color, what I'm enjoying is I'm repositioning her hands. They were horrible before. Her face, it barely looked like her. It's, she's looking a little Grace Jonesy to me right now, which I don't want. But you know what? I can take her and fix her now. I've got her in a much better place. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wash up, take a break, and uh, I'll probably be back in a little bit. Um, it's very warm in here, so I'm going to turn the AC on for a bit. But I'll talk to you later. Ciao. Hope it, hope it was helpful having, a, having somebody work alongside you, even though I was playing... Not so much. Well, no, the moth was good. Anyway, never mind. It doesn't matter. Bye. Ciao. Doop. Yep, finish. Yes, and...